I know we have a large class. So I want to thank you for coming on board today. Um, we're going to be doing uh, overcoming objections and closing the help closing the sales. A um, little bit about myself first, Jeff Clark. I'm a regional director here with Golden Care. I've been with uh, the company for come up in 25 years. Uh, I sold long-term care in the field for six years. Later got moved to this uh, position I'm in now where I recruit and train and help agents with comparing, contrasting long-term care plans, things like helping with presentations or whether you're selling to groups or associations or individuals or um, the different product lines that we carry. Um, I kind of help in all those capacities. And one of the things we like to do is some, some training, some webinars, and we like to change up our topics. So this is a topic that we haven't done for, boy, I bet you four or five years. So going into this, uh, I went ahead and dusted off some of the old ones we had, a colleague of mine, Mark Randall, uh, one of the best laundry room care uh, minds to, around, uh, had put some of this stuff together. I stole other things from other presentations. And so we kind of try to put all this together to, to help, again, some of the common objections that you'll see in laundry room care. So as I go through this, um, hopefully it touches on some of the main ones. I think we'll add to this. We'll bring this subject up again. But overall, I think it was a, it was a necessary thing. We have a lot of agents that struggle with trying to deal with some of the objections they run, some of the pushback they get from their clients. So first of all, though, every time I do a presentation, move forward. Mm -mm. There we go. I'd like to start out with COVID. You know, I, I just every presentation, every webinar I do, I just want to make sure everyone out there is aware of just how much of an issue COVID is and how much it's impacting our industry. You know, if you look around the country, 73% of all the Canadian deaths were in facilities. Um, if you received your care at a facility, you were 11 times more likely to contract and die from COVID. I can keep the rest of these stats up here. 87% of Americans believe it's more important than ever to get long-term care. 61% of people surveyed said they'd rather die than go to a nursing home. This is all from a recent Harris poll that came out. The fact of the matter is, people are terrified to go to a facility right now. And if you're not aware of that as an agent, you know, I always talk to the agents, you know, when do you bring up long-term care? How do we start that conversation? How do we, I promise you, people out there right now are waiting for someone to ask them about long-term care. It's well received right now. We have online sites that pick up, you know, uh, online referral or, or leads, web-based leads. We've never had more than we have right now. We're getting more leads than we've ever seen. And that just speaks to the fact that people are worried. They're terrified about going to facility. They would love to hear about some options that would give them some maybe home health care options, et cetera. So if you've, if you've been a little apprehensive to bring the subject up, I promise you now is the best time. Clients are waiting to hear from you. There's not enough long-term care agents out there to spread this information with them. So um, if you need any help from us, whatever you might need, take that step. Start talking to your clients about long-term care. Okay, COVID's a big thing. All right, objections. So today's webinar, again, this was just kind of a, an idea that we dusted back off, but I want to just start with this. Remember, the responses to a given objection presented today, these are just merely shared opinions from some of the top long-term care salespeople in the nation. No response to an objection is always right. We do welcome your thoughts, your ideas, your suggestions. I know there's 75 people in this webinar today, and so if there's something you feel I badly missed, or you know what, this is what you should say in this situation, I would love to hear it. Anytime we do a presentation, we like hearing from our agents. You know, Just because someone's a top salesman or someone maybe only sells a couple a year, if you have a good idea, I would love to share it with people. So, um, but also with objections, you have to have tough skin. Remember, it's our job. This is what we get paid to do. Don't let objections, you know, turn you off. It's kind of part with, and also remember that the first objection that anyone gets, these are just merely a smoke objection. You know, it has no bearing on the buyer's decision whatsoever. They're just simply kind of postponing a little bit, posturing, you know, I need to think about it. Oh, I'm not sure. Maybe I should, this is very common in the buying cycle. So the, the first objection is really not an objection. It's just kind of a, a normal or selling that, we, that all clients do. Okay. Four main reasons people won't buy a product. There's more, there, there are other reasons too, but mainly they don't think they need it. 
they don't think they like it or understand it, they can't afford it, or in their no hurry to purchase it. I'm gonna try to flush out these, uh, address these major ones here. Okay, this is big. Eliminating objections before they come. So as I go through this presentation, I wanna say also that, you know, sometimes I try to have slides that coincide with what we're saying, but a lot of times we're just answering questions they come up. So where I've taken some stuff from other presentations that passed, some stuff about Medicaid spends down or deficit reduction. Sometimes we're just gonna basically answer these questions and just you know talk these through. You will get a copy of this PowerPoint when we're done. So don't worry about taking feverish notes or anything. If you need anything, just give us a call. But you know, three things that just jump out to me as pre kind of objection, you gotta flush these out. During any presentation, you should be able to flush out some of these objections and nip them in the bud as you go along. Call these the pre-decision objection stoppers. Health. You know, I, I, I poked around the internet and, and said, you know, what are the main reasons people don't buy long-term care? What's the biggest objection they have? And depending on where I looked, you know, the health came in like the top three, top four, number five in some other surveys. So a lot of people out there just realize they, they don't think they can get long-term care. That's why they don't look into it. They don't even bother with trying to get it. But I can tell you that we have plans that will fit no matter what condition you have. If you don't qualify for traditional long-term care, there's short-term care, there's home health care only, there's guaranteed issue home health care plans, you know, true freedom. We've got hybrids, we've got annuity-based ones, lots of solutions, but do know we have something called the pivot presentation, that this presentation basically pivots as you go through and talking to your client, it's gonna talk about those things to kind of help you flush those health things out. So when you get to the end, we don't have the issue of uh, you're not gonna qualify health-wise or underwriting wise So this is something that shouldn't be, hold anyone up we have a plan for any health condition. Kids, extended family member. Um, here's a big one, and I don't really have a lot of slides this, so I'm just gonna pause and I'm gonna talk a little bit about kids. Um, when I was presenting to folks, you know, early on in my, my sales career, I would get nervous when someone said, you know, I, I need to talk to my kids or, my kids really need to talk about it. I need I need to visit with them about this. I, my you know my kids are going to take care of me. Or so first of all, what I would do is well, you know when I first started, I was kind of a, I was afraid of a kid kiboshing a sale. You know I, I like some kids would say my mom doesn't need to spend money on this and and sometimes early on I would sell a long term care policy to someone and that would have a 45 year old son call me and say, you know hey how dare you sell my mother that long term care policy. I'm gonna take care of my mom and how dare you charge her $200 a month for some long-term care policy when I'm gonna take care of her. What I hear that child saying is, I love my mom and I will take care of her and I don't need some insurance to be the substitute. But what I also hear that child saying is they don't truly understand what it means to take care of someone. And I can speak from experience here. I took care of my dad for three years, all the way from the home health care to a couple times a week to five times a week to eventually a facility, the, the, all of it. What, what parents need from their kids, it's the time spent with them. I would go over and take care of my dad some days and I had to you know, rush back, get to my you know, house. Maybe I, had, I was coaching football then, so I'd, I'd have a couple hours here or there to go help him out. So you go over there, maybe it changes bedding, maybe help him uh, with you know, bathing or showering. Uh, maybe I had to make him a meal, I had to you know, do his prescriptions and little pill bottles, you know, the, the, the days of the week uh, prescriptions. Um, maybe I had to clean the kitchen. But all this was very just running around, doing this, doing that. I'd say, hey, dad, you know, see you later, dad. You know, if you have a long-term care policy, you're not substituting your, your, your child's love. What you're doing is you're allowing that person to, to go ahead and maybe the house has already been cleaned. Your, your dad or mom's already had the bathing, dressing. They've already been fed. They, they've had, you know, the, the, the kitchen's already cleaned up. The bathroom's already cleaned up. What you can do then is go sit alongside your father or mother and talk to them. So that's what they need. That's that's really it's 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 a it's a hard it's a hard situation when you only have an hour and a half, and when you're changing or helping them get into a different shirt or you're you know doing this stuff, it, the stress is on both the parent and the child. This is not a very uh, you know conducive to healing or so. If I could if I could have had someone already have, have fed my father, maybe helped him with getting a, a shower that week. Maybe he's already gotten you know the food. Uh, the bathroom's already cleaned up. His medications are taken care of. I could just go sit with them calmly for an hour and a half. Much better time spent. 
So when kids tell you they want to take care of their parents, and that's that my kids will take care of me, just conceptualize it. Are you moving in with your child or is your child moving in with you? Are you aware that your kids, get, your child, your, your adult child is going to have to give up some time with his children? Maybe he is coaching some sports for the kids. Maybe he does have other things. Maybe he can't see his family as much. These are all things that should be discussed. So never be afraid to talk about the kids. And while you're talking about the kids, ask them very sincerely, do your children make the decisions for you? Are, you, are, your, are your kids fully involved or are you able to make your own decisions still? Nine times out of 10, they're gonna tell you, no, I make my own decisions. And the reason I'm doing that is because then at the end of the presentation, they're not gonna say, you know, let me think, I gotta to talk to my kids first, right? So flush that out ahead of time. Okay, price. Okay, again, a lot of ways to look at price. I think I got a couple of slides on this, but um, stealing from Mark Randall, you know, what he used to say is a little differently than this, but can, can you afford 20 bucks a month, 30 bucks a month for this? Sure you can. Can you afford a thousand bucks a month? Maybe not. Would you agree that you could, you could afford something in between there? Let's, let's throw something at this. Even if you can only afford $50 a month towards the long-term care policy, maybe only 60, 70. But somewhere in there, we can find some help for you. Also with price, the shorter, fatter versus longer skinny. And I do have a slide for that. Health. The biggest thing here is note is that we have an entire presentation dedicated. It's called the pivot presentation. It walks you through, it, it literally adjusts on the fly. If they tell you they're diabetic and they've got high blood pressure meds, it's gonna take you to short-term care. So you can click buttons as you go through it, as you ask pointed questions. So the health underwriting should never be an issue for you. We've got a tool for this. My kids will take care of me. I just kind of beat that one to death. But the kids are a big part of this. Don't shy away from it. Address those kids and what, they're, what your family is deciding to do head on. Ask again, are your kids planning on moving in with you? Or are you gonna move in with your children? Well, my child lives in Tennessee, so maybe not. So how is that gonna work exactly? Does your, does your, your children have full-time jobs? Do they, do they, do they coach? Do they, do they volunteer in the community? Are they active at church? How are they gonna, again, give up all these things in their life to spend the 20 hours a week that you'll require? I don't mind hitting people right over the head with this. Talk about the kids, flush that stuff out. Price. Again, you can design something that's 50 bucks a month or $500 a month, somewhere in between there. Something, some coverage is better than nothing. Okay, and on price, I have a couple things here. We do a presentation on this. It's called Designing Affordable LTC Plans. It's, a, it's probably in our library at goldencareagent.com, a pre-recorded webinar, uh, solely on designing more affordable plans. I can tell you real quick, I've been teaching this for 10 years. Long, skinny versus short and fat. Um, <clears throat> You take a look at what I've done here, and we're happy to help you with price. Price is a big issue. And, and sometimes what I see agents do is they look at the local area. Maybe they're selling in, I don't know, let's just Boston, Massachusetts. And they look at the local care, and the nursing homes start at $7,500 a month there. Um, so they'll write a $7,500 a month benefit. They'll write a four or five year or $200,000 pot of money. They'll put 3% inflation on that. This is for a 60 year old couple, and that premium is 11 grand. I think the example, yeah, we're using here is a 60-year-old couple, um, married couple, and we're doing a five-year benefit, um, a pot of money of $270,000. Now, again, if you design it with a 5% compound, a uh, five-year benefit, which is $270,000, 4,500 a month times five years is 270, and you put 5% on there, that premium is 4,800, 11,488. If I do that same benefit and I move that benefit up to 7,500 a month, I drop it to 3% compound, at 7,500 a three-year benefit, that's still a, a policy maximum of $270,000. But if I go even more extreme than that, I'm gonna go with a $10,000 a month benefit and do 1% compound, that's still a 2.1 year benefit, it still gives me a $270,000 pot of money, but look how the premiums are different. Instead of being $11,400, annually, I knock that all the way down to 5,800. And look at the benefits. This is for a 60 year old couple, average claims happen at age 80. So now 4,500, 10 years is paying 73, 20 years is paying 11,900 a month. The second example, 75, 10, and 13. The third example, 10, 11, and 12. So basically in 20 years, 
These things are all paying about the same amount. But look at the premium, half of that. So we can help you design cheaper, more affordable plans. And secondly, a lot of people are going to talk price. And so many of the clients feel that same way about it. I can't afford this $200, $300 a month premium. Well, what if they all of a sudden needed to have to budget five or 6,000 a month? Then, then where are you at, right? So can you afford to budget $300 a month in now or 5,000 a month when you're not expecting it? Naturally, it makes more sense to figure out a way to budget $300. Okay, so price, a lot of things to go there. Price is always gonna be an issue, but do yourself a favor and design more affordable plans. Try to talk with them about trying to budget in now, afford it now when you still can get it. All right, I need to think about it. Who hasn't heard that one before, right? People always need to think about it. It's just a common, no matter what. Um, I don't know. Some people say no matter what, they have to think about it overnight. I don't know what you do with that. I guess I've just kind of given up on those. But here's a couple ideas I've heard, shared, etc. cetera. Um, I'd like to call it the working period or the, we need to find out if you even qualify. You know, I used to, yeah, okay, that's true. I, I used to tell people, you know, look, I understand that you want to think about this. I, I would too. It's a big decision. So maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's September or so, uh, October. And say, so here's the deal. Why don't we do this? I know you want to think about it. We don't know anything about your health right now. We don't know about your rating. I don't know if you can get long term care. So, you know, do me a favor. Let's send an application. We don't have to tie any money into it yet. We can just send an application in here, find out if you're going to qualify. Because this day and age, trust me, half the people I submit can't get it. So I don't want you beating yourself up on a decision for the next month or two when you don't know if you can get this or not. Let's see if you're even um, someone who's insurable, right? And that way we can lock into themselves. So what is it, October here? So let's send an application in. Maybe in November when the kids come to Thanksgiving, you tell them, hey, you know, uh, kids, I applied for long-term care. And, you know, I'll have a decision here pretty soon, but I want to talk with you guys about it a little bit. Um, they're they're going to let me know this is how the application process works. Remember, I've locked my health in. So, you know, they're going to do a health interview. They're going to have to you know, maybe order records for my doctor. Um, there's a working period here. It's going to take six or eight weeks. This is, this is your time to do exactly that. Think about it. Because when I come back six to eight weeks from now, I'm going to make you an offer. I'm going to say that the insurance company said, yes, you are accepted. No, you're not accepted. Or maybe we give you a different rating. But maybe in that six to eight weeks, you decided, ah, I, might want to change. I might want to buy a little more coverage than what I initially thought. Or I decided I can't afford quite that much. So you're going to have time to adjust, to think about it, yes or no. So starting the process is just simply finding out if you can get it. What a great, because you know what happens when you don't do something, when you want to think about it. And I walk out this door, right? We, I met with you via computer, and, and we, we, we're gonna, you're going to get back to me. But what happens is people then just don't think about it. They procrastinate. By getting an application, and you're kind of forcing yourself to do the thinking, to do that six to eight weeks. You have plenty of time to, do, to think about this. There's no obligation. If you, if you, when I come back to you six weeks from now and I found out that you've been accepted and you decide you don't want to do it, no harm, no foul. We're going to go ahead and just give you that money back. So... One way to get people to be off the odd and thinking about it is tell them to go ahead and get an application. And let's see if you're even insurable. Okay. Um, you'll have this entire underwriting period to reaffirm that you've made a sound decision. Right. And again, you don't have to decide right now. You're going to have plenty of time to think about this. Um, just some other cleanup thoughts here. You know, when people are making a decision, and this is just common, when you're sitting down with an agent, be over the computer or what have you, you have 100% of the information in front of you right now. Plus, you can ask questions. By tomorrow, you'll have forgotten 50% of what you're looking at right now. The next day, you'll have forgotten 25% more. You'll have 25% of the information to make a decision on. Now, if I'm making any major decision, I want to have 100% of the information with me. I wouldn't want to rely on 25% two days or later. So you're way better off making a decision right now than you are next week, or, or I'll call you in a, in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, this again, this is another another version of the thing I came across. So when this this the client says, you know, I'll call you in a couple of days if I decide to apply. Now, actually, I kind of there's a little bit of myself in here, uh, and I guess maybe I did. Yeah, I, I would do I need the the takeaway here. 
Listen, I know for experience that once we stop talking and you don't start this process, there is little to no chance that we will ever get together again and we'll do the application. So, well, can you call me back next week? Frankly, no, I, I don't really have the time to go through all of this and review all this with you again. I've got a pretty busy schedule and I know that you're thinking about this, but if you're not gonna do this now, I don't know what's, what three or four days or a week's gonna do for you. But if you do change your mind, you know, give me a call. If you're ready to put an application in, I'm happy to help you. So with all due respect, I'm, I don't have time to call you back. I don't want to you know, pester you about this. When you're ready to apply, go ahead and give me a call. Sounds a little harsh, but it's reality. I know that if they don't apply right now, I'm just not, I'm, it's not going to happen. Don't set yourself up for a bunch of callbacks. I remember I used to have like a whole book full of people that said, call me in a couple of weeks. I finally kind of figured it out. Yeah, that just means they don't want to buy. So either you go ahead and move forward while you're there, while you have all the information there, or they're just not going to buy it from you. Don't waste your time. Tell them that if they want to, call you. Call you back if you want to. I'm not going to call you back next week. I'm not going to call you in two weeks. I'm not going to you know, beg you to do this. This is the time to do it. So if you want to, we'll be happy. If you want to do it later, you know, give me a call. We'll apply. Okay. So as far as the want to think about it, another way to look at this, um, there's three questions a consumer should ask yourself. Do I need this product? Do I like this product? Can I afford this product? If the answer is yes to all these, then, then what do we have to think about, right? You do like the product, you agree you need it. Um, you clearly see there's a need for it. And yes, you can afford it. So why not go ahead and move forward? Those are a lot of things I gave you there for I want to think about it. I hope you have some of those kind of jog something for you. All right. The next couple of, oh, these are again, these are the think about it ones. This is at the end of my pre presentation. I talk about that working period. That was my biggest one. As I said, look, you know, don't beat yourself up thinking about this. Send an application, call your kids tomorrow. Tell them, hey, I, I sent an application. You're gonna have six or eight weeks. I'll come back and we'll talk about this again. I'll call you back when we get a decision. And if you tell me don't, so that, that's really my, my opinion. That's the best one. You get the process started and then you have six or eight weeks to think about it. Okay, so again, the, the health, the kids, the thinking about it, the price, these are the, all things that you should be doing while you're presenting the long-term care plan. But then you get done and then you'll get some pushback. All right. So I want to go over some of the, you know, some of these post presentation objections you're going to run into. Um, by the way, it's 225. And I know that I have four or five more here left. I, I kind of thought this would be closer to a 40 minute presentation. So for those of you, I think the schedule was two to 230. And I, I meant to Linda probably add a little bit to that. But I'm just going to keep going here and we'll, we'll try to wrap up. And I'll do I'll open up the questions at the end here that you type in. All right. So these are some of the most common post presentation ones. Use it or lose it. All right. And I tell you what, that, that's the big one. You know, what, what if I, you know, uh, what if I die in my, my car? It looks like it's not care insurance. It is, oh, oops. Car insurance, what this is supposed to be right here. Looks like I can't edit right now. Um, so use it or lose it. The first thing I ask people is, you know, when you get a car insurance, if you don't get an accident in a year, do they give you your money back? How about your homeowners? If a tornado doesn't take out your house, do they give you that money back? How about dental? A lot of people didn't go to dentists for a year because of COVID. They were afraid to go to. Do they give your dental insurance premiums back if you don't have any cavities? No, they don't, right? So there's just, I don't know why people have to, you know, use it or lose it. It's what, it's what insurance is. But we do have these things that at this day and age, we can. Um, we can get your money back and it's a hybrid. But first of all, look at your car insurance, your home insurance, et cetera. Look at your odds. When I look at insurance, I think about insurance, I think about, you know, what are my chances of me using this insurance? Um, you know, and there's, I want to insure things that are really likely to happen. And the things that are really a long shot, I, I maybe don't emphasize that. The funny thing is, the consumers out there are kind of backwards in this respect. Everyone has home insurance. You're usually required to if you have a mortgage, but the point is that you have a one in 1200 shot. If you look at the dot here, one in 1,200 shot of having your house burned down or turned off. Now, how about um, <clears throat> your auto being totaled for a, you know, a loss that you didn't have insurance and you lost more than $10,000 to a car accident? That's five in 1,200. But everyone has car insurance. Even if your car is paid off, you still do it. People don't carry liability when they have a $40,000 car. They have car insurance. Odds of being hospitalized without health insurance for a $10,000 hit or more? Your odds here, 105 out of 1,200. A lot more little red dots there, right? 
odds of needing long-term care, take a look at that. I never like to tell people, if you need this insurance, if you need long-term care, if you end up in an assisted living facility or needing home care. When I talk to a married couple, I know that a married couple has a 90% chance of one of them needing some type of care. So I always said, when you need care, how are you paying out? When you do need this care, what's your plan for paying for it? When you need care, your kids moving in. I never said if. Fact of the matter is, this is going to happen to you. It's by far the most likely thing to happen to you. So if you're worried about the insurance part of it, the user lose it, you're going to likely use this insurance. That's just the fact of the matter. The industry, however, has come back for this. They have a, a big solution for use it or lose it. It's called these hybrids, right? The LTC life combo products. You know, if I die in my sleep and don't need it, I get a life benefit. Otherwise, if I do need long-term care in you know, a nursing home, I can use my death benefit in the form of, of nursing home benefits. Neat concept. They're commonly known as hybrids. Please, please, please. You can do so much better for your clients than selling them a hybrid, okay? And I have an entire PowerPoint to this concept, but just to give you an example, uh, this is a, I just pulled this out of my hybrid. This is nationwide. So if someone wanted to get a $185,000 death benefit, which relates to a $5,000 a month long-term care benefit, 3% compound, 120,000 death benefits. So I die in my sleep, I never use it, I get $120,000 back. If I need long-term care, I have up to 185. The premium for that for a 55 and 50-year-old couple, $9,000, okay? Because they're worried about getting their money back. So down here, what I did is I ran a traditional mutual Omaha long-term care plan for $4,700. Then I added a second to die life. That's going to refund them $120,000 upon the second one's death. That's only $1,232. My total there, $59. Here's a neat thing. I'm guaranteeing them a long-term care benefit of $300,000 and $9,000 come claim time. I'm guaranteeing them a death benefit, regardless if they use long-term care or not. So I'm giving them both benefits for half the premium or you know 40% less. And if you both want to get a 120K death benefit, so you actually make money on this, you get all your premiums back, plus, well, then you could do some type of an IUL here and give them each a death benefit upon either one of their death. Either way, you're still way under. So you look at the translation here. So for $9,000, I get $12,000 a month for a $449,000 pot of money or a death benefit of 240. You don't get both. For half the premium, I get both benefits, right? So the hybrids, twice the premium, half the benefit. Do not sell your clients hybrids. Very rare situations, or maybe they have money sitting around, so they use it or lose it. First of all, I think they're gonna use the insurance, but if they really are bent about getting their money back, sell them a little second to die life or a index UL, um, they come out way ahead and mix them together. Don't 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 combo the plans together. Uh, by the way, Mutual of Omaha has the option in their 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 uh, product that you can get three times your monthly benefit um, back, uh, your premiums back. So if I go with a ten thousand a month benefit, an example I showed you earlier, that means that each husband and wife are going to get thirty thousand dollars back if they die in their sleep. Don't you know? Don't, don't need the benefits. So let's just say a premium might be, I don't know, four or 5,000 a year, 60 year old couple, they pay 25 years worth, they might be 100 grand in. I can get them 60,000 of that back for about, I don't know, $400 more annually. Instead of going from 5,000 up to 9,000, I can add $400 onto that, so 5,400, and give them 60% of their premium back if they're worried about use or lose it. Lots of ways to do it, don't sell a hybrid. Okay, rate stability. A lot of people say, you know, I, I'm going to buy this and then they're going to raise my rates, raise my rates. And what if I can't afford it anymore and I have to drop it? Legitimate concern. I get it. Um, the industry has had rate increases. But I can tell you this. The industry has grown. The industry has gotten smarter. So if you look at the way the um, traditional long-term care policies are priced now, modern policies are much more price stable than ever before, the previous generations of them. Why is that? Well, frankly, it's because they've got so much more claims data to go on. The Society of Actuaries Pricing Study now shows that the underlying actuarial pricing assumptions has been de-risked. 
Lapse rates are now set at less than 1%. Originally, they were set at like, you know, 5%. Uh, investment returns. They're now set lower than ever. They use such conservative investment returns and interest rates now. Claim rates, they have a lot more to go on. They have 16 times more policy data and 70 times more claims data compared to 15 years ago. The regulatory requirements, consumer value, company penalties, margin for error, all this stuff, the industry has grown. So, and this all comes from, by the way, Too Legit to Quit, great article if you haven't, it's in Brokers World Magazine. Outstanding stuff that more or less says, based on 2014, the side of actuaries gives long-term care premiums less than a 10% chance of even raising 10% in their lifetime now. And by the way, that was 2014. The newer one out, I think it was 5% and 5%. Fact of the matter is, is these are very stable now. And so the old rate increases of the old people that bought it 20 years ago, that, that's just that's just how it was. Um, we can't do anything about that. And it does scare some of the people. Some of the Financial planners and some of the uh, people out there in the street will say, yeah, but they're going to raise your rates. You know, look what Hancock and Genworth did. Hancock and Genworth did anything wrong. They just didn't have good data to go on. They've had to fix that. And clean. But the industry has cleaned it up. So if people are worried about rate increases, we can get you this information. That's something you should be able to walk them through. Okay. How about if I wait till I'm older? Yeah, you ever heard that one? Uh, I had a colleague of mine say that, you know, even Dave Ramsey, which I like, you know, Dave Ramsey has so much good stuff. He suggests that you wait off a little bit of time until you, you know, the more you wait, you know, you, you won't spend as much money and can't believe that he advises that, but let's take a look at it. I did a couple slides here. The cost of waiting is huge in so many ways. First of all, this is something I just ran here. So let's just say a 55-year-old couple, um, and I just did a small benefit here, 4000 a month benefit, $100,000 pot of money, 3% compound, 90 of them down here. All right, so I took this couple, and I said, if they pay these premiums all the way till they're 85 years old, they're going to pay in a total of 105,560. The male 41,000, female 64,000. Okay. So what if I waited till I was 65 to buy that policy? Well, first of all, we have to factor in that 10 years of growth that the 55-year-old would have had. So that 55-year-old couple's benefits, if I waited for 10 years, then applied, it would have grown to 5,376 a month. And the pot of money would be at 134,392. Use the same 3% 90 day elimination period, now they're 65. So I ran the rates of the newer amounts, that premium now for them um, was, I have it in here, $6,861. So if they paid that 6861 for 20 years till they're 85, they would have paid 137,220. So it's gonna cost them about $32,000 more by waiting for 10 years. And by the way, if I waited till age 70, it was like 160,000 and it just went up from there. There is no upside as far as premium savings to wait. But interestingly here, I kind of saw this in the break even analysis I ran. This was interesting. I hadn't really seen this before, but I thought I'd share this with you. The break even point for age 55. So for a male, 129 days of care, you get all your money back. He's paid in 41,000. The female, of course, the females are more expensive, 198 days. So in other words, yeah, if I need care for four months, I get all my money back, which is easier for people to see that. Female, 100. But if I wait till 65, now I need 168 days to get my money back, and the female, 255. When people buy insurance, this is just my thinking. Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm right. But, you know, you were, am I going to get my money out of it? Is this a good buy? I mean, am I going to get my money back out of this? Should I be doing this? Well, you know, obviously, if I only need 129 days to get my money back versus 168, it's it's better. So the earlier you buy this, the more likely you're going to recoup all your money. So I think that's interesting. Okay. Another cost of waiting. Here's the thing we're overlooking. I'm just doing rates as if the rates wouldn't change in 10 years, but we know better. The hidden real cost of waiting. Now, if you look at the prices, every time a company, whether it's John Hancock, Gemworth, Mutual Omaha, when they would release a new policy series, maybe they had a policy that was out from 92 to 97, then they had a 97 to 01, then they had a you know 02 to 07, and then maybe they had the you know the, the 09 product, and they had the 2013 product. They had these little blocks of insurance. Each and every one of those blocks was a lot more expensive than its predecessor. So if you did wait for 10 years, it's very likely that the prices are going to be 
Besides just being more expensive if the rates stay the same, they don't. The new policy series are usually more money. So if you price today's policies compared to the policies written from five to 10 years ago, they're 500% more expensive than the ones that were written 20 years ago. So not only are you getting hit with this cost of you know the extra 37,000, but if they make any adjustments, if, if history is any judge of this, about every five years, they, they make a new plan. This isn't, by the way, on existing rates. Carriers are reluctant to try to raise rates on existing blocks, especially now I just showed you that the current blocks are pretty safe. But when they come out with a new block, just to, if the interest rates change, if they get any lower, or the economy's not good, you might see an increased price on that. They typically don't get cheaper. So the cost of waiting has two wrinkles there. One straight up on the rates right now, it's gonna be a lot more expensive, 30% more. But then the fact that the policies go up, it could be 200% more, 300% more. So there's no real advantage to waiting price-wise. And let's talk about when you're older. What happens when 10 years goes by? You know, the elephant in the room is, well, what if I can't even get it then, right? My health changed. You know, wife had a stroke, husband had a heart attack, uh, developed diabetes. Um, you know, he's now walking with a cane. Well, now you're out. So all you do by waiting is you cost yourself a ton of money and you lose the ability potentially to even get the insurance. So never a good idea to wait. All right, <clears throat> it's best to apply when you're healthy. You have the best chance of qualifying for coverage now. All right, should I invest the LTC premiums instead of self-insuring? I was gonna do a lot more on this, but I, I pulled one of Mark's old examples, so it's pretty quick and straightforward here. One way to decide on whether owning, and I've already done a break even analysis here on that one I just showed you, but I'm gonna kinda of do another one here. Um, consider the break uh, even point. In other words, how much care would I need to receive to recover the cost of premiums you paid in? And I just kind of showed you this the other one. But what if you invested your premium dollars instead of the you know the policy? So the example here is again, this is a 50-year-old annual premium is 1,500. Um, investment rates 5%. We're going to use a 5% compound inflation rate. We're assuming their tax bracket is 36%. And we're only going to do a $30,000 a month benefit here. Professional care is 200. So if you take a look at this. Essentially here, if I paid premiums for 10 years, it only takes me 100 days or just a little over three months to get that back or a little month and a half professional care. So even if I had this for 30 years, it's going to take me between three and six months of claim to get everything back. So people often say, hey, you know, what if I just invest my, instead of putting the premium, instead of buying this premium, I'm going to invest my, 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 at 1500 a year in a sum account earning me 5%. Well, if you, you know, get solid 5%. So, but you're not gonna get the type of the $300,000 pot of money growing at 5%. So it's it's really not the best way to try to invest for yourself, okay? Um, the Marie Randall example. The Randall family around here are, you know, we've got John Randall here as a director like myself, we've got Tom Randall, national sales director, and Mark Randall, you know, uh, their older brother that was one of the leading long-term care experts in the country. They told their mom back in 1998 that, yes, they think long-term care is a good buy. And at the time, she was 72 years old. I wrote the policy. She qualified for benefits. It was easy for 72-year-olds, and I think Marie would have probably qualified anyways back then. But I think her premium was like 39, 30, 3,800. She had a couple rate increases. I think, it, I think it went up to as high as 5,600 by the time she went on claim there 19 years later. So she's paid in 88,000 in premium over the 19-year period. She has already been paid out. She's in an assisted living facility now, using three quarters of her benefit, her monthly benefit. It doesn't even use the whole, her monthly benefit is inflated to something like 7,800. I think it's about 63 is what the assisted living is charging. So she's got an unlimited policy. She's already been paid out 165,000. It's almost 7,000 a month. She's doubled her money and, and knowing Marie, she's gonna live for you know, a good while yet. Um, she's gonna make, a, she's gonna come out very well here. So sometimes it's nice to see an actual example I do believe in long-term care. I still do, even the way it's priced now. So, you know, as far as trying to self-insure, invest it yourself, there's no better way to cover the long-term care risk than to buy a long-term care policy. All right, the government will take care of me. I got a couple more here, like it's 242. Um, now here's one again. I'm gonna kind of go through this quick because we have what's called a, a Medicare spend down calculator for each and every state. It's in our LTC CEO tool. So I'm gonna fast track here because the argument is the government will take care of me. And so we talk about Medicaid, right? And I, I don't wanna bore you guys because this is kind of, I'll get you a copy of this. 
But essentially, if you know how Medicaid works, if you're a single person, you get spent down to $3,000. If you're a married person, you can keep half the assets up to a certain amount. You can keep the house while you're alive. And then the state's going to step in and recoup that. Um, so if a spouse is living in your house, or even if a, a dependent child or even a, you know, a, a child that's living with you, they can't take the house until the, that parent dies. And then they come back and they can attach the Medicaid value to it. Even if that spouse is there upon the second spouse's death or the dependent child that's living there, as soon as that person moves out, the state steps in to inherit that house. So you can't just hide this house anymore. The point here is that they're going to spend this thing down. So if they decide to self-insure, and again, I'm not going to bore you with all these slides here. This is a Minnesota example, 2015. It just, it, now, and I have this available for any state. If you want to put in the assets, you know, their house is worth X amount. They have this much in total. House is 3000 Total um, Cunnel Blast is three fifty. dollars If they split those assets in half, um, then it's income related. And so we have a spend down calculator to tell people how much will it cost you if you don't buy a long-term care plan? So even if one spouse goes in the, in, the, in the facility or both end up in the facility, they'll show you kind of what your income's left over. But here's the thing. It's fun to show the actual numbers, but I don't do that when I'm objection stopping. Um, you know, you're gonna either lose all of it or half of it, and the state's gonna step in to, to recoup that. At the end of the day, what you're talking about is you're letting Medicaid take care of you. Um, I'm not sure in this day and age, if you look at where where we're, where the country's headed, you know we're running out of money. Frankly speaking, we're aging as a society. the The Medicare dollars are getting thin. You know, said another way, when they wrote Medicare, Medicaid, these systems, there was eleven working adults paying in for every one recipient. Well, now we're down to two working adults for every one recipient. Those recipients are using two to two and a half times the dollars they used to use. We're running out of places to put people. We're running out of dollars. So if you're setting yourself up to rely on Medicaid, I don't like to use scare tactics, but Medicaid care is going to get worse and worse. And with COVID, they had to pay hazard pay to these workers. You've heard about the staffing shortages at nursing homes, Medicaid nursing homes. 65% of them are going to be bankrupt, they're saying, in the next couple of years. Um, the nursing homes are in big trouble, and there's a tidal wave of people coming. I can't imagine relying on Medicaid as your care. And, and when you do that, you lose all your assets and your income. So, you know, uh, and you, the biggest thing here is you lose your independence. That's what I was kind of alluding to as I, as I skipped through there. So relying on Medicaid, you know, and the spend down and relying on the government, well, the government will take care of me. I hear people tell me this. Boy, I just don't think that's a good option. And again, without scaring them, just point out the fact that these are overburdened systems that are running out of money. They're, we're simply running out of able-bodied caregivers to take care of people. We're aging society. We're getting so top-heavy that you need to plan for your own care because there's not going to be much help left from the government. Not because the government's a big, mean you know, instrument and doesn't like old people. It's because they're simply running out of dollars and resources to take care of these people. You really need to be mindful of that and tell your client it's better to plan. Okay, last one here, I think I got, a, I got two more. The government will take care of me, part two. This is the other thing. People say, you know what I'm gonna do? And I, I, I love these guys. You know, I would go to their house, you know, I used to go on the field back in the day, you know, and they, you know, some farmer would look at me and he'd, he'd cross his arms, he leaned back and said, you know, I transferred my assets to my kids more than five years ago. My lawyer helped me do this. I can rely on the government for my care and I don't have to worry about nothing. I, I, I a three year look back, five year, Listen, the Deficit Reduction Act of 2005, sweeping legislation that more or less said, there's no more taking unwarranted advantage of Medicaid. Medicaid is already broke as it is. We don't need millionaires taking advantage of Medicaid. Well, first of all, just at the top, I look at some of these people and go, great, so you're gonna hide a million dollars and you're gonna go take care of advantage for a system that's set up to help the truly needy and impoverished people. You know, part of my said like, oh, this guy's a dirt ball, right? Like, I, I'm not trying to work with this guy if he's trying to hide things. Like, What's the point of me trying to give him? Okay, but here's what I would point out to this guy. A couple things happen when you transfer your assets. Number one, you put your assets in your kid's name, they're still working and paying taxes. You've now put them in a higher tax bracket. So by putting the assets in their name, you're costing them, I don't know, two or three grand more a year in taxes. Your grandkids are probably not eligible for student loans now or grants. And that daughter-in-law that you never really trusted, when she divorces your son, she's gonna take your farm. Take your land, take your assets. So 
you've costed yourself more money than a long-term care policy in via of uh, higher taxes for your son when you could have just bought a policy for a couple grand, taking the tax deductions on that, it would have cost you about $1,000 or $1,500 and your whole farm, everything would have been protected, all still in your name, all in your control. And besides that, let's just say that it did work. You were able to, you know, somehow hide your assets and take advantage of Medicaid, basically, you know, steal from the poor. Do you really want that? I just talked about, do you really want Medicaid? You have a million, trust me, you're not gonna be very happy with the care you received in Medicaid. So even if you can pull this off, be careful what you wish for. So anyway, the Deficit Reduction Act cleans up a lot of this. They're, they're telling people, I don't care if you transferred your assets five years ago. If you go, if you transferred your assets five years ago, half a million dollars, and you go to a nursing home and you're there for 12 years, you're basically gonna be exempt from any help Let's just say nursing homes are 50,000 a year. The first, um, I guess an example would be eight years that you're there, uh, 10 years that you're there, you're, you're not gonna be covered because you're, you're, you're knocking yourself out because you've transferred a $500,000 thing at 50,000 a year, that means you're ineligible for Medicaid help for 10 years. That's what Deficit Reduction Act does. So it doesn't work anymore to transfer assets. It's illegal, there's still lawyers trying to do it, there's still lawyers telling people they'll do it for you, but it really doesn't work. Okay, last thing. The complication factor. People don't buy things they don't understand. I always said during your presentation, you should take care of this, but otherwise, there's really only three things to selling long-term care, folks. These are so easy. All a client has to know is how much will this policy pay me? Whether it's five thousand a month, seven thousand a month, right? How long will it last? Well, that's a pot of money. If I sold them a quarter million, I can tell them it's going to last them for three and a half years. If they're getting home care, that could be a little longer because they're only getting care twice a week. The third thing is, when do I start getting it? I tell them, well, as soon as you hit your triggers, your two out of six ADLs, or you become caught, it'll start 90 days later. So if you can get these three things down or communicate these three things to your clients, that's 95% of the policy. The rest of these things are just bells and whistles. There's nothing really to it. So how much, how long, how soon? That's all a long-term care policy is. Don't make it any more complicated. You'll, you'll make more sales. Okay, so that's what I have. That's, that's version one of this presentation. I'm hoping it's helpful. I'm gonna bounce this out of here real quick and see if we have questions. I'm sure we do. I know we're running long right now. Okay, I like. Okay, what I've got here is people are saying, you know what, when I when, when I tell the kids, hey, I'm mad that my mom bought this long-term care policy. You have a kid call and say, hey, you're not, you're spending my inheritance. That's very true, uh, Don. I, I do see that. People think that the kids get in their mind that you're, you're spending up their inheritance. In reality, you're saving their inheritance, right? Um, Will it be a follow-up email on this? Yes. With the slides, yes. Will you distribute the presentation? Yes. Um, what about partnership qualification? Um, for that one, I can tell you, I'm not a, I don't care about partnership. You know, uh, that's another whole long answer. Some people buy policies for partnership. I know partnerships are pretty, you know, snowball's chance in heck of being used. That requires someone to actually exhaust their policy, then exhaust all the rest of their assets down to the equal amount that they had in maximum benefits, 90% of claims don't go beyond two or three years. So that 1% of people that actually have a partnership plan that can access it, they still have a half a million dollars sitting in the bank. And if they wanna go on partnership, they go on Medicaid, they can forego that half a million dollars and go to some crappy nursing home or facility. Of the, of the 1% who can only get to the partnership, less than two out of those 10 people, so two tenths of 1% will actually even use partnership if they have the ability. So the, the, the chance of using partnership are so slim, it just, it's a great thing to get in the house. It's a great thing to excite people about it. But at the end of the day, no one uses partnership. I don't care about designing 3% compound plans. I don't mind using a higher amount with no inflation. Um, all right. All right, then I have another question here about the related 1%. In some places, by the way, 1% inflation does work. 2% inflations do work. You have to check in your state of that for partnership. Um, rate stability. We've had met many clients talk about the increases from year 17 to 220. Depending on the policy you're sold, yeah, rate increases are always going to be an issue. Uh, it's it's all if you go to the internet, you're going to find stuff about it. We can get you the um, broker world information, the Society of Actuary. I again, this is call it my opinion from my reading. The plans are so much safer, so much more stable than they used to be. Um, is there any guarantee? Of course not. I'm never going to guarantee the premiums, but I feel very confident about the plans we sell today. You just don't see the rate increases we had from 10 years ago. Good short and fat um, example, thanks for that. At what age would you recommend someone to sign up for long-term care? That's a good question. You know, 
I, I don't know if that's if that's the um, I don't know if there's a perfect age, but typically, you know, mid 50s, 57, 58. Um, you know, you never know what's going to happen. Health wise, you could have some issue come up at 57. My my own brother in law had a stroke at 56. So, you know, uh, ideally, probably mid 50s, uh, latter 50s is probably the best age. OK, that's all I really have for questions there. There's a couple other ones here that, you know, if you want to give us a call at the office, I suggest you do. Let me minimize this. I want to just thank you guys for coming on board. Our number here, 800-842-7799. If any of you want to call and talk about any things further, we'd love to hear your suggestions. You know, on, on this on this objection, this is what I like to say. Um, I would love to hear it. Uh, anything that we could share. This, again, is meant to be a sharing of ideas from a lot of uh, different salesmen. So I hope this was helpful. I hope that some of you guys got something out of this. Thanks for staying with me. There's still a very large class here, so I hope it wasn't too boring. But if you want this, uh, there'll be a pre-record of this version sent to your email, but we have pre-recorded versions of all the other presentations we do at goldencareagent.com. Uh, there's a reference library there of all of our marketing tools, all of our products, all the presentations we have. Um, otherwise, give us a call to the marketing office. We're happy to help you put some plan designs together, depending on the clients you're working with, 800-842-7799. I do apologize for kind of going a little fast here, I guess. I had a lot more to get in here in a short period of time, but thanks a lot for coming on board, folks, and we'll do this again soon. Um, Jeff Clark, again, thank you for coming on board. 800-842-7799 if you need us. Thanks a lot. Check out our website, goldencareagent.com, or give us a call at 800-842-7799.